because we were trying to find, because we can't find this place here on the map. We're Are trying to these? find the command and control centre. I've got to say, the RF police kit is very, very shoddy. Want to be in shot or? Not really. Okay. Would well, you want to stand there for a sec? I suspect you're about to be a victim. Mark Thomas is the chap's name. What's the subject? It's uh, maps of Britain, basically. No, rubbish. It is. Maps of Britain. It's absolutely yeah, true. Yeah, come on. Look, look, no, what's, it is. What's it's it's the... called the map of Britain. Right. It's absolutely but true. In, yes, we're not, talking, we're not talking cartography here, are we? Some of you may already feel that Britain is an excessively secretive place. Um, and indeed, I think you're right. When you get examples like Clive Pontin, who's put on trial for actually telling the truth, or government uh, employees who can't actually tell you what they had for lunch for fear of breaking the Official Secrets Act, it seems to be a tad absurd. Indeed, this excessive secrecy leads to absurdity. And I think here's a brilliant example of it, because on this map here, I'm here. You can just see I'm there. Um, and you can see a footpath just stops dead. That footpath's just down there, and that just stops dead, and there's nothing in this bit here which is slightly weird, because actually there is. This bit is in this bit here, and um, this is Burfield Atomic Weapons Establishment. This is where Britain assembles all its nuclear um, weapons. It's like a Kinder Egg toy that you put them all together here. Um, and you can see there's nothing there on our map. They've just left it out, apart from 1976, when they accidentally included it. Someone had a fit of madness and put the truth on a piece of paper. We've been going around the countryside, we've obviously found places which aren't on maps, but are physically there, and occasionally they crop up on old maps. Is this a common thing? Does this occur with regularity? Oh, yeah. It's an awful lot of sites. Two, three thousand sites across the whole country. That aren't on the maps? That are not on the maps, yeah. Two or three thousand? That's a lot of things. And there's also, there's many other sites which are not named, which appear under a very neutral frame, works. Millions of people must pass this work sign every single day. What they won't know is that this junction is a secret junction and actually leads here to RAF Welford, the biggest American arms dump in Europe. We'll call it Junction 8.5. Bit Harry Potter there. I suppose really it comes back to that whole thing of knowledge is power. Of course, yeah, and the map is the ultimate form of power knowledge. It tells you it's exactly. a scientific document, it tells you what is there, or supposedly tells you what is there in an objective way. Of course, it's no more objective than the, the headline in the sun. Over the past few months, I've been looking at Britain's secrecy and compiling my own map of Britain because there are thousands of sites that aren't correctly labelled there or don't even appear on the map at all. I've managed to find a few secrets, some of them are kind of open secrets, some of them are kind of, you know, you can know it but you mustn't tell too many people kind of secrets. Some of them are actual proper bona fide nudge nudge wink wink don't tell anyone secrets. Uh, I've managed to break the Official Secrets Act which isn't that hard frankly and I'll also be telling you some of the state's trade secrets. I bet you didn't know that during some disasters or emergencies in Britain, 90% of our telephones will be cut off. The government telephone preference scheme was designed to be used during a nuclear war, but has been used since at such disasters as Piper Alpha, Hungerford, Lockerbie, the Brixton riots and Aintree in 1997. One of the classics was at the Grand National Meeting at Aintree in the mid-90s, where there was a bomb scare. The problem was that once the phones were cut off, somebody in the bomb squad had forgotten to register their phones, so they got cut off as well and had to use hand semaphores in order to communicate with each other. They had it. The bomb squad had to hand semaphore yes, across and, Aintree. Yes, and then they got to borrow some of the police mobiles, which were still on, so that they could talk. Straightforward military cock up. What this means as well is because we've become ever more increasingly dependent on telephone lines, that everything goes. It's not just a matter of the phone goes here. This is oh, yeah. internet. Yeah. Oh, very much so, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I don't know how many zillion emails are sent every, every year in the UK, but the whole ability of 55 million people to send emails gets wiped out as well because they use an exchange line. And it's the exchange lines that get closed down. It's very quick, very 100% effi efficient. Um, but our ability to talk with each other has gone. Unless we know semaphore. 
unless we know semaphore, yeah. Here's a tip. If you're caught in such a disaster and you need to make that call, use a public phone box. They are category one and you won't be disconnected. Morning. Just doing a bit of filming out here. Uh, we are going to be here for a couple of minutes. Do you want to be in shot or...? Not really. Okay. Would well, you want to stand there for a sec? <laughs> the bizarre thing is, is when you have a culture of secrecy, the things that you should be able to see, which is how governments make decisions, who makes them, why they make them, are there any outside interests involved, whose interests are they working in? You know, that kind of stuff which we expect to see, you're not allowed to see. But, conversely, you're actually allowed to see some stuff that perhaps you shouldn't be allowed to see. This is Margaret Thatcher's house, and um, this is the plans for Margaret Thatcher's house, which you can get at Westminster Council. You can get the plans for her house here. Now, you can see just behind, this is the dining room here. Behind that's a study and, and then a cloakroom. Down here in the basement area, we have a series of vaults, as you can see, one, two, and three. And then about 10 metres along this way, I'd imagine sort of 10 metres roughly here, in fact, by the plan of it, um, there's her safe, Mrs. Thatcher's safe. It's just there. And behind the safe is the staff bathroom, which is great. So if you go to the loo and you work for Mrs. Thatcher, if you just take a little pick with you, you can slowly work your way through. Do you ever go inside? Are you ever allowed in? Just for, to the loo or anything, are they? I'm just, just curious, I've just been curious. These are the indicators of a government oil pipeline that runs around the countryside. Uh, it moves from uh, oil, aviation fuel, from refineries to military installations all around the countryside. And it should be fairly secret, you know, apart from these things. I mean, these things kind of blend in a little bit with the country, don't they? But it should be kept fairly secret. And you're thinking to yourself, Mark, how did you know that these, that under here is this military secret pipeline? Well, you can get publicly available a map on where to find these oil pipelines. And this one, is just here, between Calm and RAF Lynham. It's not very secret, is it? Could you give me the location of the government pipeline between Calm and RAF Lynham? No, I don't think I could give you that. Is there a reason why you couldn't? I think you, you have identified it, but um, although the, the pipeline is in no way secret, uh, we would not wish any more than any other pipeline operator to make its route widely available for obvious reasons. Sorry, the, the reasons being security reasons? No, I mean, it's the same reason as any other pipeline operator would not wish the information to be widely distributed. It's just that you can actually buy a map with it on there, though. I'm standing next to one now, actually. Pipeline CP, CF6 Oil. Is that part of the pipeline? Well. I'm not sure what the purpose of, of your question is, sir. It's really to find out what is in the public domain and what isn't in the public domain, and what is secret and what isn't. Well, the route of the pipeline is not a secret. Um, so it's not the route. It, route isn't a secret. The pipeline route. Is, the pipeline location is not a secret. It is publicly available. Right. That's, but but that's kind of. But you've sort of changed now because initially you said that you didn't want it made available. I don't. Here we are in Wiltshire, about seven miles out of Bath. This is Corsham, and under the ground here, 100 foot underground, is Britain's command and control centre in the event of a nuclear war. This is a place where all the civil servants and the parliamentarians and Tony Blair will be rushing to. It can actually house and hold 5,000 people in this huge series of underground bunkers. It's, a, it's basically a city underground. They've got bakeries down there, they've got a pub down there called the Rose and Crown, uh, just in case you and Blair fancy a drink. But What's incredible is since the advent of, of the Cold War ending, actually, you have to question what's the need for this? Why is there a skeleton staff on this place? You know, how much is it costing us to keep this huge uh, sort of underground city going? And also, if it's so secret, um, which it's supposed to be, there was a, a, a recent upgrade uh, in the 80s of the communication system here. It's supposed to be really sort of top secret stuff. Why can you actually get a phone number for the command and control centre? You can get the phone number from directory inquiries for the Caution Command and Control Centre. I'm just going to give them a a quick call and see if we can get them on the line. Welcome to Joint Support Unit Caution, supporting Headquarters Defence for Communication Services Agency, Two National Communications Signal Brigade and the Global Operations and Security Control Centre. 
Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. My name's uh, Mark Thomas. I was wondering if you could help me uh, because I'm trying to find the command and control centre. I'm just trying to get a sort of bearing of exactly where that is in the sites here. Um, well, I, I'm not at uh, liberty to give you that information, sir, because I don't know who you are. Um, I'm, I'm going to be talking to anybody for all I know. Mark Thomas, Channel 4. How are you doing? Obviously, what we're going to ask you. You're right there. How are you doing? We're just, filming there. Yeah, that's, that's that's just asking you what your. Uh, we're what trying to find the command and control centre, and we've just had a chat with people at for... the for the, the the big thing under you know the underground bunker with the sort of five the room for five thousand civil servants in the pub. The bunker. I, yeah, I the... mean, I don't know what you mean by the bunker. Uh, because there's the command and control centre that's right. that's here, um, and it's this is the bit we're after. Right. So we're after the Whitehall bit, really. That's what we're after, this bit here. Well, it, it doesn't exist, I'll tell you now. So, it so, so it's not yeah. there? No. Hi, Susie Thompson, press Pleased to meet you. Uh, How are you? What can I do for you? What we're after seeing was the Burlington Bunker. Right. If we could. There is no such thing as a Burlington Bunker. Right, OK. It's a, it's a word that's bandied around, and we certainly don't use it. Okay. We have what, underground tunnels. Right. Can you give us a few? Um, I mean, we'd really like to get a bearings to where actually the, the the command and control centre is. There is no command and control centre. So what you're telling me is is the Burlington bunker complex, something that would 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 have, you know, be the uh, receptacle for civil servants to work during uh, course of wartime or nuclear war or anything like that. That doesn't exist. You're saying that doesn't exist, no, it doesn't exist. and it hasn't existed. I'm unaware of that. That's probably classified information, but certainly, you know, we have no knowledge of that. Right. I think, I think it's a word that is banded around yeah. willy-nilly, frequently in papers. And yes, we have underground tunnels, but we don't refer to it as Burlington at all. What, do, you, do you know what you do refer to it as? Underground tunnels. Just underground tunnels? Yeah. So is, is there no, do you have no bit of it that you give a name to? No. So it's just You do. We don't. We just well, call it the underground tunnels yeah. complex. Simple as that. But there must be bits in the underground tunnel complex that have a name because you have to get, you know, you have to get there. It has to. Yeah, you go, you go down our number one entrance. Ah, so you go, so it's numbers. So there's bits of. Number one entrance, right? Underground tunnels complex. Yeah. Right. There's no mystery about oh, this. No, no, at I'm all. just, I'm, you know, I'm just asking. You know full well that um, access to Ministry of Defence sites is controlled via Ministry of Defence, and mm. you have to make an appointment to see any particular. Well, we're just in the neighbourhood, and we dropped in. You don't just drop in, come on. I wasn't born yesterday. No, we were, we were just driving, we were, we were up in Wales and we were just driving back there. So you so thought you'd just call we in caution? We thought we'd pop in. Okay. What you need to do is write to us if you want to, yeah. to visit any aspect of our organisation, yeah. such as the underground tunnels, and your request will be considered. So what do you want to come and see then? Everything. This is Portland Down, this is the MOD's uh, Chemical and Biological Weapons Testing Establishment. And you're asking yourself, what are you doing here, Mark? Well, I'll tell you why I'm here, it's because I saw this film. The only way that scientists can finally ensure that their devices for the protection of man are practical is by trying them out on man himself. A respirator designed to protect a human being cannot be tried out on an elephant. What have you been here before? I have, sir. Good. Well, there you are. You see others. It can't be all that bad. He's come back for a second try. Now, in the mid-50s, the government were considering doing uh, testing of nuclear shells on the ranges here. Uh, and they decided it might be a bit too embarrassing lobbing radioactive materials around the place. But we managed to get a map um, uh, from the Public Records Office which showed the area they were going to fire the shells in. And they've called it Palestine. Here in the heart of Wiltshire. A little bit of the Gaza Strip. Now, I don't know what significance that is, but it's quite odd. Uh, no, sorry, we didn't realise we had to have authority. Yeah, you should have authority. Who are you, please? I'm Mark Thomas from Channel 4. Pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet you. Have you got some ID on you, please? Certainly, I have. And, sorry, what's your Will name? Have you stopped filming? Have you any complaints about your treatment or the amenities whilst you've been here? No. Uh, when you go away, don't talk to your pals or to civilians about anything you've seen or which you've heard about during your stay here. I would, 
We're just being escorted off Porton Down premises by a police escort, which has followed us behind us. They've asked us to leave. But before we go, just thought I'd tell you, there is a big greenhouse full of dope here on the Porton uh, Down uh, establishment somewhere. Um, last year, the Home Office granted for medicinal research a license to grow the dope for GW Pharmaceuticals. It's here, it's somewhere. Somebody one day will find it. Dentist, Mike, Dentist. You've seen some of the absurdities that are thrown up with a culture of secrecy, but there are other stories, other issues uh, that are far more important. Equally as absurd in some ways, but far more serious. Stories which are hidden and concealed from our view, which we know the merest details of. This is RAF Greenland. This was where the American air bases were, this is where the nuclear weapons were, this is where massive protests took place. And there was a thing a little while ago that came to light called Operation Overture, which was a scheme run by the government. What they meant was that they would take soil samples of Britain's nuclear establishment and try to work out the traces of radioactive elements in the area. They would therefore make comparative analysis of other countries' soil samples and try and locate where their nuclear bases were. In the course of doing this, Two scientists from AWE, the Atomic Weapons Establishment at Aldermaston, published a report because they found that here at Greenham, in the 50s, occurred a dispersal of uranium. Now, it wasn't huge and there seems to be no present danger, but at the time, the government was saying nothing happened. The scientists go on to actually say that they suspect this relates to an incident in 1958 when an American plane crashed and burnt here and they suspect that a nuclear weapon was actually on board. Again, the government completely deny this. Now, there's a, a map here that shows the dispersal of uranium and if you can look, this is the runway goes along here, this is where the runway goes along and you can see according to this map of the trace of uranium, the uranium has been dispersed by the planes taking off and, and landing. Now, we don't know for certain whether there was a, a plane here that crashed with uranium on it or not. What we do know is there's a whole load of evidence that points that it might have occurred. And we'll never find out unless we have proper freedom of information. Because at this point, whose interest does secrecy work in? The Ministry of Defence said there was no nuclear weapon involved in the 1958 fire, and subsequent studies have not replicated the results of the original study. If those measurements were reliable, the presence of uranium in 1961 still remains unexplained. Welcome to the most polluted house in Britain. In the garden here of this house, actually the radiation levels are way above those that they should be. Now government agencies insist that these levels are nothing to be concerned about and actually aren't a threat to public health and safety. However, it has been a threat to the person who actually lives here. Basically I've had just terrible problems with my bone marrow, um, liver, kidneys, uh, just the body's been completely bloody attacked from the inside. What is the matter with Ray? At the moment, <clears throat> he has symptoms and effects of radiological poisoning, meaning nuclear material. Ray, what are the guys doing here at the moment? What they're doing, they're taking core samples from the ground now to honestly analyse of what could be in the ground. The insurance company are, are, are paying for this. So the insurance company are paying for yes, boreholes to test holes. for the toxicity of the site? Of the site, yes, before they embark on trying to repair the damage to the house, if they ever could. There was a Shell oil depot behind Ray's house, which in 1990 was developed for housing. Not surprisingly, the developers didn't test for radioactive substances. Since Ray became ill, an independent environmental consultant tested soil samples from Ray's property, which gave some of the highest levels of plutonium and uranium contamination recorded in Britain. The clincher is the uranium. So although you've got 50 times more plutonium than you should have, the uranium isotopes are, are, are such that that footprint is only from a nuclear reactor. You couldn't get, you couldn't get any um, uranium in nature with that ratio of those two isotopes outside of a nuclear reactor. Shell have said that no nuclear material was ever stored or processed on their site. The Ministry of Defence also deny that they have ever used the area. But plutonium doesn't just appear from nowhere that came from a nuclear reactor. Now that doesn't mean that there's a nuclear reactor at the bottom of the garden, but it certainly means that that stuff came from a nuclear reactor and you have to ask, well, why is it here in this, this little so suburb already? It could, have, it, it could, it, have, been it could have been brought by rail, but anyway, why would it be? Well, I, I wouldn't know. I mean, I wouldn't know why there would be a nuclear reactor here, mm. to be honest, but that's one possibility. Oh, oh. 
This is RF Bryson Norton. It's from here that uh, Britain's nuclear uh, equipment is... Uh... Hi, hello there. Hi, I'm Mark Thomas, Channel 4. How are you? Hi, how's about? Thanks. Just wondering if you have permission to film? No. No, not at all. It's just uh, we're on a public highway, so we thought we'd, that was that's all right. Sure, OK, I'll, I'll leave it at that for the moment then. I've got to say, the RAF police kit is very, very shoddy. They look like old second-hand Harringtons that have got a couple of stripes put on them. Anyway, here I am at RAF Bryson Norton, and this is where Britain's nuclear deterrent is put onto planes, flown out to America. The amazing thing is, as soon as it gets to the easterly point of American seaboard, the plane touches down and the nuclear materials is unloaded and transported by lorry and car and stuff on land, because in America it's illegal to transport nuclear materials over uh, civilian areas by plane, because they are safety conscious. In Britain it's not illegal. We take off the planes here, they fly over Swindon, and Bristol and parts of South Wales and um, the Ministry of Defence say it's fine because these containers that the, that the nuclear materials are in are drop tested from heights of up to nine metres. So as long as the planes are at 30 feet, we're fine. This is a recording of the alarm sounds used by BNSL on the Sellafield site. Now, if you happen to live near the Sellafield nuclear complex, here's a useful tip. This BNFL phone number puts you through to a recorded announcement that plays all the different safety alarms. Criticality alarm. Now, the criticality alarm sound is whoop, whoop, whoop. Local airborne contamination alarm. Local radioactivity in the air is nee noo, nee noo, nee noo. So listen out, and if you hear any of the alarm sounds, just run. Here's a useful tip if you want the power to intercept people's emails and internet communications. Why not spend £25 million of taxpayers' money building yourself a National Technical Assistance Centre here inside MI5's headquarters? That way you can have permanent links to black boxes at every internet service provider in the country, making it easy to intercept almost anything that passes across the web. We don't just have state secrets here in Britain, we have a state of secrecy. This leads not just to the absurdities that we've shown you earlier, but to genuine secrets, which I hope to be showing you later on. I'll also be talking to a Rear Admiral and a spy, but first, here's Whitehall's secret tunnels. This is a ventilation shaft for a part of the Whitehall tunnel system. It runs north to south of Whitehall, it's used by the MOD and by government. Now this bit here is the top bit of the underground citadel. This is kind of like the cap of the citadel. It might give it away by the fact that well, you can't really get in there. Uh, it also runs along here, along to Buckingham Palace, uh, allegedly, and the Queen can scuttle down to the nuclear bunker should it all kick off. This is the Treasury, and under the ground here is a six-acre citadel which links up and is part of the Whitehall Tunnel Complex. Now, you can actually see a bit of it if you buy a ticket and go here, which is the Cabinet War Rooms, which, in fact, ha is part of the underground citadel. Now, I know some of you go, Mark, this is so irresponsible because you're now giving away our secrets to these Al-Qaeda ninjas. Well, the trouble is with secrets is this isn't really a secret. The real secrets are actually paid for by us, and this is why. Last year, Labour actually said they wanted to redo the whole tunnel network. Why? I'm not sure. Some kind of new IKEA catalogue slash kind of changing room thing they wanted to get going down there. The MP said, how much is it costing? What's going on? Why do you need it? The government said, you can't find out. It's secret. Now, the problem with this is we pay. In 1994, they actually found out that Margaret Thatcher's brand spanking new nuclear bunker here at the Ministry of Defence building ran to an 80 million quid overspend. It should have been 50 million. It came out 130 million. 80 million quid borne by the taxpayer. Trouble with secrecy of this kind is it tends to cost us the money. If you're a company director and you're looking for competitive advantage, here's a useful tip for you. Ask the British government if your business is important to Britain's economic interests. If they say yes, you can set up a security liaison office and that'll give you access to MI6, Britain's Overseas Intelligence Service. They then will give you their secret, confidential reports, which in turn will give you information on the security and political risks of entering a foreign territory. You can use them for your own internal distribution, rewrite them, but most important, it'll give you useful inside information on your competitors. Here's a trick if you want to write secret messages just like MI6 do. Take a Pentel pen, 
and write your message. Take a plain sheet of paper, place it over, press down. Remove the paper, destroy the original message. Take your secret fluid pen and write over. All is revealed. Outside the film festival, Cairns is the moderately pleasant home to the Euro yuppie. It's also home to Richard Tomlinson, an ex-MI6 agent. We've had to come here to talk to him because he can't come to Britain or he'll be arrested. We've come here to talk to him about one thing, which is MI6 involvement in commercial espionage, which is on the up, which is probably illegal, definitely immoral, and well out of order. This difference between MI6 and the Foreign Office, because the Foreign Office, they also work overseas trying to get uh, deals for, the, for British firms, helping British firms find their feet in a foreign country, helping British firms make contacts. That's the job of the Foreign Office Commercial Department. What MI6 does, they, they, they go in and they've got, they've got um, to do more or less the same job. They're, what they can do, which the Foreign Office can't, is MI6 can pay bribes, and that's basically the difference. MI6 can go in and say, look, come on, we'll have a little meeting on the side, and if you tell us a little bit more than you told the Foreign Office, we'll give you a little bit of money. So that's basically what mi 6 job is. It's basically um, uh, an organ a part of the, the Foreign Office which, is allowed, which can p pay bribes. Mm. But I find this incredible because Britain's just signed up to the OECD Convention mm. on Bribery and Corruption. Mm. Yeah, we're supposed to be outlawing bribery and corruption. Yeah, and yet well, we're actually sanctioning. Them. Yes, well, uh, yeah, yeah. That's what uh, MI6 exists by bribing people. I mean, they, they they phrase it around in a different word. They don't actually say it's bribing. It's a they they'll phrase it around in a completely different way. But payments to informers is what their, is their bread and butter. I mean, for example, a bank would have a have a huge advantage if they knew that mm, Germany was going to move its interest rates next week, or uh, it would cause give them a, a big advantage. Well, you're actually responsible for for blowing a carder. Mm which was the, the British MI6 mole mm. within the Bundesbank. Mm. What, was, what was happening there? What the MI6 officer's job there was to, was to pay a German citizen an ally, from an allied country uh, uh, to break the law of his own country. And so you, there you have an official from Britain in Germany taking taxpayers' money to pay bribes to a German official to break the German law. And in the European Union, you. You know, we, whatever people might think about the European Union, we've signed up to it. We have to obey the laws of it, and it's totally illegal under any under under European laws to do that. You mentioned British Airways mm. earlier on. British Airways have, have got a link with MI6. Mm. I believe you mentioned that the BA staff are actively recruited mm. by MI6. Yeah, well, well, you know, that could, they can be very useful. Um, they, they get access airside in airports, so they, they know the way around airports, and they're, they're, they're useful people for MI6, you know. So, so they can just st see you through, take you through? Yeah, and captains uh, as well, uh, um, you know, do odd jobs for, for MI6 as well. Like? Well, for example, diplomatic bags. Uh, you know, normally you have, um, uh, well, God, I can't remember what they're called now, HM messenger services, people who, who fly around the world in business class carrying the diplomatic bag and they carry it as hand luggage. And uh, sometimes if, there's, if they need to get something back urgently and there isn't one of these Queen's messengers about, they, 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 they sort of give it to the captain and he carries it off. And usually if, if, if it is something that urgent, it's because MI6 have got something in there. And, you know, he can be sitting there carrying, carrying a gun or carrying all sorts of things, you know, Not un, you, unwittingly, but uh, they never, you know, you can have all sorts of things in the diplomatic bag. You mentioned that MI6 operatives were trained well, that's or yes. some of them yes, 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 well, yeah. in, in high altitude parachute drops. Were BA involved? Well, potentially if they wanted to say, fly over a sensitive country, they could fly in, in the um, airline aircraft lanes. These are very, very high altitude lanes which the, the aircraft fly down and they would, they would have to uh, uh, adopt the call sign of a regular passenger jet to you know, not, mm. not, not avoid suspicion from the air traffic controls of a potential country. So yes, they would then in that case they would adopt the, the call sign of a British Airways jet that, was, that flew regularly over that, that uh, route. There can be genuine reasons for, for secrecy um, uh, and one has to respect that, but there needs to be much better measures put in to prevent the government and protect, pre prevent the intelligence services from using the secrecy laws merely to cover up their mistakes. British Airways aren't aware if any of their current or former staff work for MI6. They told us they didn't know whether the military have adopted their call signs, but they wouldn't give permission if asked. 
They, along with other national carriers, do carry diplomatic bags on their aircraft. Anyone who's making a programme about official secrecy really should talk to a chap in the MOD behind me. And the chap's name is Rear Admiral Nick Wilkinson. He is the chairman of the Defence Advisory Committee. And the D Notice Committee, as it's called, what it does is it advises the media on what should and shouldn't be included in the press, which may or may not threaten national security. And it's all sort of done on a nudge and a wink kind of thing. It's the first time that the chair of the Defence Advisory Committee has actually agreed to be interviewed on telly, so we're quite excited. What does the Dean Notice Committee do? Uh, basically, it's a, a committee of um, civil servants and journalists who get together twice a year to talk informally about um, mutual um, concerns about national security. It's peculiarly British and it, and it grew up, as these things often do, um, a long time ago, in um, 1912 in fact. And this informal committee, which has no statutory basis whatsoever, has remained in existence ever since. It's evolved, but basically it's the same idea. Where would you want to see the official secret secretary going? Um, that I I'm afraid I just can't comment on because I know too much on the official side about what is going on and um, I would be breaching what I have in confidence on that side. I would certainly hope to see it looked at. Um, it's, it's an old act, 1989, and all acts need dusting off uh, from time to time. It was last updated when the Cold War was still you know, just kind of tailing off. And things have moved on. And uh, as I say, all old acts need another look. One of the things that strikes me as odd here is that there are thousands of sites mm. um, on the UK that are disguised mm. or have misinformation. You'll often mm. see sites with works mm. written across them or things like that, which are, mm. in fact, military installations. Mm. On this Ordnance Survey map, if I can just pass you that there. I need to find my glasses to look uh, at it. That's OK. <laughs> Uh, Burfield appears, as you can see, and it's actually got the buildings. The, there's a site drawing there. Mm. Now, this one here in Burfield, you can see it's not there, this recent edition of the OS. It has been taken off by, um, we presume, by the, by the MOD. If you rang me up with a query, I would investigate whether there was still some reason why some information you wanted to publish could not be published. That is what I'm here for. Yeah. If, you, if you rang me up and asked, can we publish it, yeah. I would investigate, and I might find there was a reason, I might not. If there wasn't, I would say, as far as I'm concerned, go ahead and publish. OK, well, we'd, we'd like to leave that with you, if that's OK, okay if you could find yes. out. Yeah. Hmm. Fortunately, there are a few laws and loopholes that help make Britain a tad more accountable, and I'll be telling you about them later on. It's the Freedom of Information Act, though, that's supposed to help us get access to information. And I'll be showing how MI5 colluded with the American security forces to monitor requests for information made by the relatives of the Lockerbie bombing. First, though, we wanted to talk to someone who'd actually had experience of MI5 withholding information. We live in an overly secretive country. Yes, Would that be something that you generally go along with? Absolutely. I mean, in this country, information is secret unless someone decides it's open. Um, whereas most countries, information is open unless someone decides it's secret. It's a fundamental difference. And the government's freedom of information legislation is, quite frankly, helpless. Uh, if you look at the Labour's commitments in opposition, they were substantial to freedom of information. And ever since 1997, they've been watered down. David Clark, who was a minister responsible in 1997 for introducing legislation of this nature, produced a very good white paper. He must be the first cabinet minister in history to be sacked for trying to implement his party's manifesto policies. I was with Norman Baker, the Lib Dem mm. MP, the other day, and um, he was after his file. Mm. Um, he's a member of parliament, mm. you know, he's not a terrorist, he's never been involved mm. in any violent activities at all. Mm. Um, and he won his case that MI5 should hand over, mm. that the, they're actually subject to the Data Protection Act. Yeah. Mm. What are your feelings about this as in relation to MI5 and how that relates to that culture of secrecy? You have to realise that when a, a personal file is handed over, 
the, there is already built into that a great deal of protection for all the other leads where that goes to. For example, in his personnel file, the, he, he will find a, just a whole string of numbers, which, which are the, 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 the identity numbers of other people. I, the, the identities of other people are in no way compromised. So there is, in fact, nothing, nothing dangerous about handing over his file. So Norman had won his case, but hadn't received his file. Since he thought MI5 were in contempt of court, we went along to their offices to see if we could shift them a bit. There's, there's no bell. Is there a bell? Hiya. I suspect you're about to be evicted. All right. Yeah, can, can I ask you, please, do not call them any people in the foyer here, please. That's fine. Do not, absolutely, do not call them any people. That's fine. Can I just... Do you have, do you have official business? This is, uh, yeah, we do. This is Mr. Baker, MP. Yes. Do you have an appointment? I've come to make an appointment. You've come to make an appointment? Yes. One moment. <laughs> You have to turn it off when, when someone comes down. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you mate. very much indeed. Needless to say, Norman Baker MP still hasn't seen his file. This is a lovely little document, the Southwark Council's list of statutory information to which the public is entitled. There's loads of stuff that you're actually allowed to see that you have a right to find out about. Um, from where the hazardous waste or radioactive materials is stored and licensed in your area, to personal files that social services have, to unregistered land, to also to the register of interest for your council uh, elected members. But there's also a rather lovely thing here, and this, this booklet, by the way, is so good that we're actually going to put it on the internet, because all, all this applies not just to Southwark, but to, to everyone's council. Um, there's a lovely thing here, the Local Government Finance Act 1982, Section 17. What it means is any member of the public for two weeks of the year is allowed into the council offices and can get any receipts and paperwork about their accounts for that year. You can ask to see for the uh, councillors' receipts for all their expenses, you can ask to see um, the expenses for any developments done in the area, for conferences, for anything. Um, and they have to give it to you. Not only do they have to give it to you, they have to let you copy it and go away. And then at the end of the two weeks where you're allowed in to have a look at things, if you've found something that's gone astray, you can go and visit the auditor who will be at the council and you've got a right to talk to them for, uh, and tell them what's been going on. Now. This, obviously, there are some councils which are slightly more open than others. Um, we found a, a couple down in Wales called the Frankhams, Mr and Mrs Frankham, and they actually found that their council, Ebba Vale, weren't quite as open as Southwark, and um, they actually found that they weren't actually quite as, as clean as they should be. Fighting the council is worse than fighting anything. The laws these people got to protect them is unbelievable. Glenys and Colin used the Local Government Finance Act to inspect council financial records. Their three-year campaign resulted in the conviction of 12 Blanagwent councillors for falsifying their expenses. One councillor, they had an election in between the time that he was charged to the time he went to court. And he was going around telling uh, the people in his area, you know me, you know me, honest as a day is long. I won't let you down, you know me. As soon as he got back in and went to court, he pleaded guilty as charged. <laughs> But if, it's, if there's nothing to, nothing to hide you, when you just... And the deputy mayor. And the deputy mayor, and they're all doing community and the service. Leader of the council. Because well, and the, they have and the leader of the fight. council. We've done it because we knew that we was right. Oh, yeah. So this law, basically, the, the important point here, though, is that anyone can use it, and it applies to all uh, local governments. Yes. Yeah. But this is incredible, because it now the precedent you've set, you've actually shown that... Ordinary people can go into the yeah. council offices and say, I demand to, the right to inspect all of your accounts and I want to know exactly what you've done with my money. Yes. Right, yeah. I'm standing outside Balfour Beatty's head office and it's because I am a shareholder in Balfour Beatty. I have a share. In fact, if you buy a share, they're running at one seventy-two, one pound seventy-two pence today. That's how much it would cost to buy a share. Under company law, if you're a shareholder, they have to let you in. And they have to let you in to inspect the minutes of the annual general meeting and the director's service contracts. This means you get a right to go in there and see what directors earn what for doing what, which is great fun. And for £1.72, you can't go wrong with it. What I was phoning up about um, is, as a shareholder, um, I would like to come and inspect um, the director's service contracts and minutes for the last two AGMs. Yeah, it's just that we want to get in today, just because it says in the, the um, 
Companies Act that should be open for business for inspection on each day. We'd, we'd really like to do it today. Right, made me appointment, £1.72's worth. I'm going to go in and have a look at the director's contract, see how much they earn. See you in a bit. Oh, you're allowed to copy down all the stuff that they earn as well. Viscount Weir, the chairman of Balfour Beatty, works up to 50% of his time for £150,000 a year, payable monthly plus expenses. The minutes of the annual general meetings were really quite boring, but we found out something when we were inside. I wasn't aware, this is, this is the great thing that we just found out, is what you can do is any publicly listed company under the Financial Services Act of this year has to actually let people in. You don't have to be a shareholder. You can come in and inspect it, because if you want to buy shares in a company, it's reasonable that you should be able to inspect the director's contract to see what it's about. So, in fact, any company that's publicly listed... Uh, have you got a copy of the FT there? Uh, we could go through any publicly listed company and actually go through it and say, we can visit this company and demand to see them. I've got an idea. I think everyone's... Do you realise what this means? This means from now on in, there are no demonstrations, there are just inspections of directors' contracts. Bet you didn't know that 70% of Britain is still owned by less than 1% of the population. But if you need to find out who owns what, then don't bother coming here to Her Majesty's Land Registry for England and Wales. In Scotland, if you need to find out who owns what, then you can just search under a list of names. But that's not the case here at the Land Registry. Besides, between 30 and 50% of land in England and Wales isn't even registered. So, follow my tip, let's write to the land registry and get them to change the rules. And here's the address. Here's a top tip now if you're worried about an impending hostile attack or invasion on Britain. Keep your radio and TV on at all times. This is because the BBC and the government have invested close to 3.5 million in a new national attack warning system. This system's going to replace all the air raid sirens, etc., that they used during the Second World War. There's a new BBC centre set up to control all the warnings. There's protected transmitters that are going to work even after an attack. And the BBC have even got a new special duties manager who's located in the building behind us here to run the show. Here's a tip if you travel by London Underground and you hear this automated announcement. This means there is a serious problem on the station, and the station may need to be evacuated without causing a panic. So, please keep your ears open for further announcements. Of course, in my case, the opportunities for ridicule are enormous. I enjoy buildings, at least some of them at any rate, and I enjoy looking at them. After casually flicking through this, which is the Duchy of Cornwall's accounts, you come across a little statement here which mentions the fact that he actually owns a, a hotel in Reading. And so we thought, oh, that's quite interesting. What would Prince Charles be doing with a hotel in Reading? After all, this is the man who actually proudly boasts about how beautiful architecture should be and how carbuncles are springing up all over the place and all of that. We thought hotels in Reading, it's got to be something in the sort of mode of Gaudi or, 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 or Wren or someone like that. So we went to the land registry and had a look around and we said, oh, can we have a look at some of the hotels in Reading? They pulled up this. And yeah, Prince Charles owns the Holiday Inn in Reading. That beacon of lovely architecture that non-carbuncle. And in that sense, it will be my own small contribution towards a vision of Britain. This bit of paper here um, could actually get myself and the director, the producer and the crew all arrested because this bit of paper is uh, notes that were made um, from a document that we really shouldn't have seen, um, according to the state. In fact, this was made from an MI5 document. And what it relates to is um, the flight Pan Am 103, the Lockerbie flight. In 1995, an American intelligence summary written three months before the bombing was released under the US Freedom of Information Act. It warned of a terrorist attack and specifically mentioned Pan Am as a likely target. Pamela Dix, whose brother died in the bombing, wrote to John Major about this. It was at this point that MI5 got involved. This document here says, the state, US State Department will try to monitor any future requests for information under the Freedom of Information Act so we are not put on the defensive again. So in effect, uh, the security forces here, MI5, are in collusion with the security forces in America to try and stop the relatives of people who died in Lockerbie 
from getting the information they have a legal right and a moral right to. Certainly my immediate impression um, is to take exception to the idea that requests for information would be monitored in any way. Well, the other thing that's significant is where they say it is difficult to see what difference a further warning would make. Um, to me, it's a question of adding up two and two to make four. Mm. And if you have a series of warnings, um, the cumulative effect of such warnings must have a greater impression than perhaps a single warning. And the fact that these warnings were specific to Pan Am um, is still something that even this document suggests is, is not relevant. Um, we fail to see um, how this can possibly be the case. I think what this sort of thing suggests is that we cannot be confident that appropriate use is made of information available before these atrocities. And that will continue to be the case so long as uh, those affected by the atrocities remain uncertain as to whether they have been uh, told everything that was available beforehand. And the question arises immediately, of course, of whether September the 11th would still have happened had the full truth about the run-up to Lockerbie been known and the lessons applied. And we do not have confidence that that's the case. We thought Jack Straw should see our notes on the document, so we dropped a copy into his office and waited. And waited. And waited. And waited. A week later and Jack Straw still hasn't got back to us. All he's done is pass the letter on from the Foreign Office to the Home Office, who haven't commented on it. So what have we learnt at the end of all of this? We've learnt that Britain's secrecy laws are wholly inappropriate for our needs as human beings in the 21st century. Um, they're either absurd, so I can show you, uh, you know, tell you about something on the map, but can't show you it on the map because it's been excluded, or it's even more absurd. Ray Fox wants to know why there's 40 times the level of plutonium in his garden that don't, should be there, and the MOD, all, all they say is, well, we can't comment because we've never owned or used the site. Well, it doesn't matter, this is plutonium, right? It's very dangerous. If it's not yours, it's someone you should be finding out about it. Um, we've got a situation where I can be arrested because of the Official Secrets Act, uh, because I've seen a document that shows um, that the British government seemed to be colluding with the Americans uh, to deny the relatives of the Lockerbie bombing access to information, which seems absolutely mad that you're stopping people finding out the truth about their loved ones. Um, the only glimmer of hope we've got on the horizon is that when we spoke to Nick Wilkinson from the D-Notice Committee, he said, yes, that's absurd that Burfield does all on the map, I should talk to the MOD. And the MOD turned around and said, yes, it's absurd, we'll put them all back. So the MOD have said they're going to put all the sites back on the map next year. So if you live near a military installation that's not on the map, let us know because we want to check that it's there next year. Not really a blow for democracy, more of a limp-wristed slap, but better than nothing. <laughs>Is that alright if I sketch that? There are bylaws to stop you filming the establishment. Okay. So alright. Edit the bit out about the establishment. This is the atomic weapons, this is where yeah. they're putting together, isn't it? Well, I have no clue what they do, I just I just go around the boxes. Oh, I'll tell you, mate, they put them together, eh? Alright. <laughs> okay. Mark Thomas is the chap's name, and it's Channel 4 TV over. Okay, that's all I wanted. Thanks. Okay, thanks a lot. Cheers. Do you not want their names? Do you not want their names as well?